Today, we're gonna do volume two of Post Myths. The first episode was so successful, we wanna do another. Stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Five Things, a web series dedicated to answering the five burning tech questions that you have about technologies and workflows in the media creation space, plus tech stuff I dig and how it's used. As always, I'm your host, Michael Thomas, and today we're taking a look at five more post myths with volume two of this popular topic. Did you mean post serial myths? Uh, no, everyone, Vince, Vince, everyone. No, this is post production myths. Because I have a fantastic myth about post serial. You know, a lot of people out there think that there's paint thinner in post serial because there's trisodium phosphate. And, uh, That's actually and, and not I'm sure true. Trisodium phosphate it's like is baking fantastic. Soda. But why don't we cover that in maybe volume three? Let me show you what we do I'll here. Let, I'll, yeah. So let's get started with volume two of Post Myths. Now, if you came to my live show, you may have already seen this, but it turns out most people at the shows didn't know this. So here we are. Did you know that you don't have to upload a compressed version of your product to YouTube? You can actually upload much larger files like ProRes and DNX and YouTube will accept them. Yeah, of course, who would actually wanna do this? Well, I do mainly because I'm vain and well, let, let's back up. YouTube does have their recommended upload encoding settings and your NLE and transcoder probably have a YouTube preset as well. Both of these typically recommend an H.264. However, if you shot in a higher end camera, H.264 is a huge hit in quality from the original file. Plus, no matter what you upload to YouTube, YouTube will recompress it again. Let me repeat that. Whatever you upload to YouTube, YouTube will recompress it. There is no way around it, despite what you see on forums. These presets exist because not only do they make your upload time shorter, but it also taxes the transcoders over at YouTube HQ a little bit less. Think about it. YouTube has over 86,000 hours of video uploaded daily, and all of those files need to be transcoded to the various flavors YouTube can display. So they wanna maximize their computing and storage resources. It's a win-win. You get a quicker upload, and YouTube can turn around the file faster. Unfortunately, this means you take a hit in quality because you're dumbing down your high-res file all the way down to H.264. So if you have the bandwidth and you have the time, upload your ProRes or other high-res masters. You will see a quality increase and you can thank me later. Everybody knows that. That's not a myth. I have a myth. That's not a knife. That's a knife. Okay, Mr. Vlog, you do your myth. It, all right. That is false. Those drive cradles were made for technicians to easily mount drives and to clone and dupe several drives at a time. However, I'm seeing them pop up more and more on editors' desks. This is crazy. Bare drives are not floppy disks. You can destroy the drive in many ways. You can shock it, drop it, get it dirty, and wear the connector. The first issue, scariest and most damaging and easiest to do, ESD, or electrostatic discharge. And don't tell me you ground yourself before every touch. Maybe you ground yourself before you remove it from the bag, but then you move about the room, you roll your desk chair, you pick up static. And for the record, just touching metal isn't good enough. You have to touch grounded metal. So the metal legs of your desk ain't gonna do it. The second is a no-brainer. You can drop it. Now maybe you're saying, but I can drop it in closed drive too. Yes, but even the most basic of enclosures have some form of shock buffer. And if they don't, you should not trust your sensitive data on those either. The most overlooked is finger oils. Touching the circuit board of a drive with your bare hand is going to transfer oil to it. This oil can break down the components, but more likely will become a bonding agent for dust to build up that will insulate components and cause them to eventually heat up and fail. In addition, your finger oils can create electrical connections between components. Lastly, that hard drive connector was never made to withstand many inserts. It was meant to be connected a few times. It's not USB. The more you use it, the more it wears. The cheaper the drive, the less times it can be connected. But Vince, 
we always have another backup. This one is laughable. <laughs> I've been to facilities where that backup bear drive is safely stored off-site and a cut needs to go out tonight. You just shocked your bear drive and now you have to spend a few hours of time retrieving the backup. A team of AEs, editors, and producers are on the clock for those few hours of retrieval. Now, I know you're also saying bear drives are cheap and convenient and I don't have to keep track of all of those power supplies. All right, so you're going to start acting like a technician and stand on an anti-static mat with an ESD wrist strap and wear ESD gloves. Plus, you'll keep isopropyl alcohol on hand just in case, right? But even if you did that, Drives out of enclosures are still more susceptible to vibration, and the drive's little vent holes are more likely to attract dust and dirt. That's right, enclosures have vibration dampening and obviously provide a further barrier to dirt. Bottom line, handling a bear drive is akin to Russian roulette. I, it, uh, Russian roulette. Uh, Hi, everyone. What do you want to talk uh, about, cereal? No, no cereal this time, but I have something that's a little bit more Russian roulette, something that's dangerous, and you don't know what's going to happen. So, excuse me for a second. Let's jump into the next myth. <music> Apple makes ProRes, so there's little reason for them to make it available on Windows or Linux, right? Kinda, unless you show them the money. Yeah, Apple developed and owns ProRes, and Apple is very protective over this wonderful codec. See, Apple licenses third parties to use ProRes, and Apple is very selective on who gets this distinctive honor. Normally, it's hardware implementations of ProRes. That is, done on a dedicated hardware chip as opposed to in software. This could be a camera or a capture card. As Apple itself doesn't make any hardware encoders to create ProRes, this wouldn't introduce any potential competition to them. If it is done in software, then it's normally in a software solution which would not otherwise compete with a potential Apple software sale, or is a higher-end piece of software that makes buying a Mac to accomplish the ProRes transcode a viable option. Now, there is a market for unauthorized implementations of ProRes on Windows. You've probably seen them advertised on forums while Googling a tech question. Many of these companies are now out of business because Apple lawyers don't mess around. Play On top of that, with unauthorized implementations, there is no guarantee the file will have the same visual quality that an authorized implementation may have. It also isn't guaranteed to play everywhere or have a long shelf life if the creating software disappears. If you're in a post-production environment that needs to generate media that goes through QC, you may end up failing QC by using one of these unauthorized apps. Apple maintains a list of Apple ProRes authorized products. Sadly, they don't break it down by OS, so it's not always clear what platform Apple has authorized for that application. So, yes, you can create ProRes on Windows, but it's probably going to be expensive or unauthorized, so choose wisely. That was pretty good, but as usual, you're too technical, and editors don't need to be technical. What? So... Ah! I'm just kidding. Of course editors have to be technical. Editors today need to know how to edit in every possible NLE on both Windows and OS X platforms. At the very least, they need a basic understanding of how the systems work and how data gets in and out of them. In addition, editors need to know the basics of sound cleanup and color correction. This is at a minimum. Editors should also have a thorough knowledge of Photoshop and After Effects. You're saying, what, Vince? You're crazy. I do fine without any of that. And maybe you do. But when a producer needs a problem fixed and the editor in the bay next to you can come to the rescue, who do you think they're going to call back first next season? You need to be a Swiss army knife. Yes, it's great at cutting, but it can do all this other stuff in a pinch. Today, many producers have smaller budgets and they are looking for one-stop shops. All this knowledge allows you to be that shop for smaller indie projects and development presentations. And when those producers grow and move on to bigger, better content, they're going to bring their savior with them, their Swiss army knife. But wait, if I'm going to do all of that, I need more money, right? Maybe, but with computers making edit decisions and posts being farmed out to other countries, the only way to stay competitive is to offer everything they need in one stop. 
Now, you're probably saying that's a lot to learn. Where do I start? I'd start by exploring all that your current NLEs can do. Become an expert with color correction tools, both curves and hue wheels. Jump into the sound capabilities and examine the EQ. Break back into that effects drawer and find new uses for them. I did this and noticed the star wipe was missing. It blew my mind. But with my skills, I was able to recreate one in After Effects. Once you've become an expert at your NLE of choice, then become an expert with competing NLEs. On your next show, teach the AE your workflow and learn theirs. The AE will be thankful, but you'll be the real winner. Keep moving from program to program, and before you know it, you'll be creating Star Wipes in seconds. Star Wipes, Vince, that's a pretty dated reference. Dated? This freaking room is dated. You've got a Mac Lisa over there, and what are those, lizards? Uh, first of all, that's a Macintosh SE, show some respect, and some Tyrannosaurus Rexes. Once again, you're being too technical, Michael. Okay, everyone knows what title safe and action safe are, right? Quick refresher for those who don't, some NLEs call them guides. These guides are a holdover from the days before flat panel televisions, when CRT tubes are what every household had. CRT tubes curve, which cause portions of the video on the screen to be distorted or possibly not even visible. Action Safe, the largest guide, was meant as a guide for TV and filmmakers to know what action may not be visible on end users' TVs. Don't go past that guide for important action, and you're okay. Title Safe, as the name implies, does the same for titles. It's a smaller area due to the curvature of the tube's edges. So, the rule of thumb was to keep titles within the Title Safe area. But, you may ask, Michael, how is this even relevant now that everyone has flat panels? And you'd be right. And then you might ask, but if I don't need to use the guides, can I go right to the edge of the screen? And I'd give you a mean side eye. Even flat panels have what they call overscan, or areas of the video image that the end user doesn't see. And how large this area is can unfortunately differ from manufacturer to manufacturer and country to country. You obviously don't want anything important in this area for fear that it may be lost. And in terms of aesthetics, having anything important near here is traditionally discouraged against. So nowadays, and I'm looking at you, YouTube folks, <laughs> keep everything within action safe. All modern flat panels can display it, and your important content won't run off the screen. As for personal preference, I like keeping text still within the title safe area, as I find it easier to read than having the text extend off the screen. Have more post myths other than just these five? Ask me in the comments section also. I please. do have a comment that I would like to uh, make. Of course you I, would. I think that this show might be a little too technical and over a lot of people's heads. Uh, I want to know what they think. Should should the show come down a bit and be about more practical things like like five things about a GoPro or maybe about the decor in here? Maybe maybe it needs to be updated with a Justin Bieber car cardboard cutout or or change the Mac Plus to it compact. What do you guys think? Answer down below. Uh, be sure to visit Moviola for the rest of this series and all the other great learning content. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, and until next episode, learn more, do more. Thanks, Vince, and thanks for watching.